Ione, and I'm the founder of Uplifting Content. And today, I'm joined by one of the founders of Known Supply, Cole. Cole Silius. Damn it, <laughs> Cree Silius. It's a tough one. It's, it's written right here. It's, it's written there, but it's in a type of calligraphy that I struggle to read. <laughs> and it's and it's a technically kind of made up yeah, Greek name really we established. Yeah. yeah. My name is also Greek and I have a lot of Greek people tell me they've never heard of it. Um, but anyway, today uh, we're going to have a little chat about uh, Cole's amazing organization and also share with you a little bit about um, a partnership that we have been talking about doing to bring you some beautiful uplifting clothing designs that are sustainably made um, and also you just know where they come from. So yes, tell us, um, say hi, tell us where you're from. I just did a really long rambling introduction there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, and I'm also gonna stop leaning on the table because it makes things bouncy. Um, but yeah, first of all, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself, please, and uh, what you're doing here in this, this cool space. Yeah, so Cole Crisilius, I, uh, we're, we're right here in Costa Mesa, California, which is home base for me. Um, I am a social entrepreneur and uh, have been really working at this intersection of social impact and business for the last 12 years, specifically focused within the, the fashion space. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get maybe a little bit more into my backstory, but very little of that had to do with my sort of personal interest in, in fashion. I, I sort of came about that pretty accidentally. Um, outside of that, I am a dad of two beautiful little boys and uh, a wife of 10 years. And so, you know, this is sort of our life right here in Costa Mesa. Lovely. It's beautiful yeah. out here, by the way. Quite yeah. a little ways away from LA. I was just driving, driving yeah. this morning and kept driving. But it's stunning and mm. I need to spend more time out here. Yeah, you do. The nice thing about down here is uh, it's right by the beach. Mm. So you don't have to fight traffic. Uh, a lot of people here ride their bike to work. And so... You know, it's a nice life. Yeah, it's a good little rhythm. So what I'm most inspired by, because we um, have been catching up, just, just talking, and also to Travis, the co-founder, I'm so inspired by what you're doing. You're just telling me about the best beanie ever mm -hmm. that you guys made. And they've got like a little booklet here. It started off as a Kickstarter, but it's just like from the beginning of how clothes are made from the, uh, the alpaca to the people that raise the alpaca to the to like where it's happening, to the people that shear the alpaca, to the people that like do the wool. Like no one ever thinks about all this yeah. stuff. And a lot of the time it's sort of poor quality materials or, or in sweatshops. Yeah. Like yeah. this is brilliant. So yeah. can you tell us just a little bit about like the backstory behind Known Supply and, and what you are doing? Yeah, of course. So uh, really while we were in college, we, we had a couple of really fun opportunities. And one of the things we did was travel internationally. Uh, and volunteered with different aid organizations who sort of have this desire. We grew up in the Pacific Northwest and didn't, weren't really exposed to, I don't know, global uh, trends, like uh, different people, diversity, different cultures. And so we had this desire to go and see a bit of the world. And this it, is you and Travis? Me and Travis, yeah. And, and one other of our uh, early co founders with our first brand, Crochet Kids. And uh, you know, one of the things that stood out to us far and above everything else through all those travels was that uh, we met people. Mm -hmm. We didn't meet statistics. We were, we were sort of armed with this, with the statistics about global poverty and what it meant to be living in a developing country and how, you know, how hard these people's lives were. Mm -hmm. And not that those things weren't true, but what was, was, sort of false in the whole thing was was the way that people were treating the way that people were um trying to make impacts and trying to aid these groups of people and, and it, it we just saw that it was very short-sighted that uh the way that that these aid groups were coming in and trying to help were in often cases creating cycles of dependency mm. or weren't believing in the in the capabilities of people to build their own Futures. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of in this context that we started to ask questions around like how do we how do we celebrate and shine a light on on these incredible people? How do we tell a different story around around poverty and what it means to help? And that it's not about not about our our solutions that we can come in and bring to them, but it's about 
how can we lift up and and just put some fuel on the fire and the, the incredible energy and movement that's already happening in these people who are wanting to take control of and uh, really set their own course for their life. Mm. And it was in this context that we started our first social enterprise, which was called Crochet Kids International. Which we have um, a giveaway for, by the way, so I'll share the link to that. Check it out. Giveaway. Started out with headwear, sort of similar to what I'm wearing today. And our backstory, and we can choose how much to get into this, is that we knew how to crochet. Uh, how my, did you know how to crochet? My older brother taught me how to crochet. And is that with this little, because I, I think I had a thing, like a little like stick thing and it's got pins and you sort of do this like around the pin and you lift. It's not that, oh. although it's similar, like you could make a similar pro okay. product. So the best way to think about it is, is people, more people know knitting. Knitting is yeah. the two needles. Yeah. Um, crochet is one hook. Mm -hmm. It's just a tiny little metal stick with a hook on it. And you do that to tie a series of knots and and make crochet. all kinds of products. Yeah. yeah, so we knew how to do that. We actually had a had a brand while we were in high school called Crochet Kids, uh -huh. where we'd make custom hats for skiers and snowboarders, and we thought it was our get-rich-quick scheme in high school, and it was great. It was super fun. We made a little bit of money. Nice. Um, learned what it meant to sort of design uh, clothing at one level, and, and we did that, but later, through our experiences in traveling abroad, we said, hey, this is actually a very simple tool that could be used, if not for our own sort of gain. We could actually teach other people how to do this. It's mm. very, if we could figure it out, other people probably could figure it out and do it way better than, than us. And so uh, in the summer of 2007, we, we trained a group of women how to do this in Uganda. We had done a lot of research and worked with a, a lot of local organizations to, to establish our work there. Um, to establish the organization, and then we had a business where mm. we were making headwear in Uganda, selling it in the States um, to fund that cycle and to give more and more people jobs and opportunities. And, and one of the early things we did um, was that we had the women hand sign every product that they made mm -hmm. because we wanted, in the same way our experience had been that we interacted and got to know people, we wanted people to realize that these products were not just another hat on the shelf, but that it was a, it was a gateway into learning about somebody else's story. That, mm -hmm. that the clothing we wear uh, is actually is still to this day in large parts made by human hands. Mm -hmm. And what if our thinking uh, moved beyond simply, you know, is this cute? Does this look good on me? Do I feel good about wearing this to an understanding of, does my purchase positively impact the life of the person who made it? And we wanted to provide sort of an alternative way to experience clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've been doing for the last almost 12 years. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. My, my mom is obsessed with knitting mm -hmm. and she's kind of semi-retired now. So she's just on a knitting bender, like all the time <laughs> knitting. And she knits so for, it's insane. She knits for like all my friends, yeah. kids, my friends, me, everyone. Yeah. Um, and there's something so lovely and yeah. she doesn't do kind of like grandma knitting. It's like really current, yeah. modern, beautiful things. Absolutely. Like I bought this lovely off the total shop that she knit and everyone's like, your mum made that? Like, yeah. yeah. It's so lovely to have something yeah. from someone mm -hmm. when you know that, that someone has taken that time and mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And so, yeah, just simply putting the name of the person on the label yeah. is brilliant. And so that was your story. Like, do you, have you sort of seen, or do you know much about the impact that comes from sort of the other part of fashion, which is sweatshops and places where conditions are awful and people aren't being treated well. Have you, have you, do you know any much about that or have you just sort of solely been finding people that you can teach and support and work yeah. with? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because initially, as I said, we didn't start off to change the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we saw a group, a community, of women specifically in northern Uganda who had gone through decades of civil war mm -hmm. and rebel army violence. Um, and we wanted to help in that capacity. Um, but as we sort of continue to grow in our business and understand sort of the way that the rest of clothing is made, 
it, it has it has changed a bit of how we think about what we do to to really at large trying to change and solve some of the things that are blatantly wrong about fashion. Um, it's something that I don't like to focus on in a lot of ways in the sense that it's like, these people are doing it bad and we're doing it good. Um, but some of the realities of the fashion industry today is that it is uh, the second largest polluter of our planet. Wow. So just from an ecological level, um, fashion, both in its production, so um, low regulations and, and how items are produced and how chem and the chemicals mm -hmm. that are used to do it is, is one side of it. But the other side that people don't always think about is the waste that's created on the backside. Yeah. So when we are shopping and we are buying inexpensive clothing that's very trend based and we're saying, okay, we're going to buy this top and it was only five bucks. So I don't feel bad about, you know, getting rid of it, throwing it away or giving it to Goodwill. Um, that is creating an enormous, enormous amount of waste mm -hmm. every single year as well. And so that's one side of it. The other side is, is sort of the human rights issues that are perpetuated through, through that process of, of producing clothing. Um, one of the most jarring statistics and, and statements that I've come across is that garment manufacturing is actually one of the largest contributors to modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, you know, products are being produced in developing countries where again, there are low regulations, um, where a job at a, at a garment manufacturing facility is, is appealing, but um, there's lots of human rights abuses that come with that. And some, some are familiar, some are things that we've heard about or know about, um, you know, issues such as child labor. Um, another one within fashion um, manufacturing is um, huge, huge, huge gar um, gender inequality. Mm. Um, predominantly, uh, different statistics will say above 70 or even above 80% of, of actual garment workers are women mm -hmm. um, who are being treated unfairly. And so, you know, the interesting thing is, is our fashion is actually very uniquely positioned to help solve uh, a lot of different social ills and challenges um, that we're faced with. And that's one of the ways that we talk about it is, you know, a simple thing that you could, that right. you are doing every day, you know, right. um, purchasing and wearing clothing. This is something that actually, because of its ubiquity, because of how big and how the scale of this industry, um, those decisions add up and those decisions matter and, mm -hmm. and what we purchase, you know, actually can make a significant and serious impact on not only the planet, but also in helping some of these, helping um, some of these larger brands like begin to have an awareness and a consciousness yeah. as, as they say, as they see more consumers demanding choosing, and asking yeah, yeah. And, and, and choosing other alternatives where right. that is a thing. I think a massive problem is, is this, like we're all conditioned to have and buy and have yes. all these things. And when I was 21, um, I went shopping, my mom took me to New York and mm -hmm. I had a bunch of birthday money and just bought a ton of clothes. Mm -hmm. And I remember bringing it all back from saying some family friends, I had all these clothes laid out mm -hmm. and it was just really unfulfilling. Mm -hmm. Right, because we're all conditioned to like have, 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 and buy, 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 and stuff, 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 mm -hmm. and then you buy it all, and then a few days later, you're like, oh, it's it's nothing. And in that moment, I kind of realized that we just need to break out of this cycle of just consuming for the sake of consuming. Like, and and so now I've made that choice to rather than buy, go to a you know a, a, a Forever Twenty One or in the UK, it's a shop called Primark where it's yeah. like you know three pounds or something. Yeah. Like rather than buy you know, 50 items that fall apart and cost nothing, like yeah. buy four or five mm -hmm. or 10 um, mm -hmm. really well-made stuff that I can like look after and take mm -hmm. care of and just, you know, just just appreciate and value the stuff that yeah. we have rather than just buying it to chuck it away. Yeah. But I think that takes an awareness in people to kind of wake up to that mm -hmm. and, and then also really realizing the impact that we're having by just mm -hmm. consuming all that, that cheap stuff. So... Yeah, I try not to be preachy, but it's like, we could just, just make that choice. We yeah. can make that choice yeah. if you choose to. Um, and it's better quality stuff. So um, Absolutely. Yeah, and the other way to think about it too, which is just kind of fun, is like thinking, 
you know, so much of when we're buying in with sort of this short term mindset is mm. that we are buying trends, you know, this, this mm. trend is hot. So I want to capture this floral print or whatever's happening here. And then in, is that going to be relevant in six months or 12 months or whatever? Um, probably not. And so you're tossing it out the door. Uh, and so two, my two thoughts and actually I've never really thought of it this way. So I'm, I'm real time sort of processing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but my two thoughts are one, um, when you, when you, uh, purchase in the way that you're talking about, which is like choosing items, um, not only are, are those things going to be, you know, well-made and they're going to last themselves, but the other thing that you're going to be doing is avoiding a lot of bad looks when <laughs> yeah, you look when back you, on yeah. your photos. You There's know, stuff that I've never even worn that I yeah. bought and then got rid of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. You're, save, you're really saving yourself at the end of the day. <laughs> this is a great and, point. And, uh, and from your from your children in like 20 or 30 years looking back and being like, "Mom, Dad, you what is wrong that? with you?" Yeah. yeah. So it's not really about like saving lives of people or changing the world, but just also saving yourself. Saving yourself. <laughs> when I think that at one level, I mean, that's that's one of the the, the unique challenges in in fashion um, and in a shift in mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Is helping, like we as people, myself included, is, and especially when it comes to our fashion, we're very selfish. Mm -hmm. We are, um, you know, we're not gonna purchase items that don't look flattering on us. Um, we are con like, you know, savings and money conscious. Like there are things that are very real in like inhib um, inhibitors to like, trying to do things more ethically. Um, and somebody asked me once, they said, well, will that ever change? Like, will, will people really be willing to spend the extra dollars if all, to buy something that's more ethical? Or are they just gonna be in this trap of saying, uh, you know, oh, it's cheap and I need it now and it looks fine and, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just gonna go with it. And my response was like, how do, you know, the question isn't whether people, you know, isn't whether, you know, people are selfish and then be doing something ethical is unselfish. And so there's this disconnect. The question is, how do we make the things that are ethical, the, the things that are doing, doing it right in the first place? How do we make that a selfish decision? Mm. So how do we make it easier for people? Make to it make easier that choice. and make yeah. it a part of a part yeah. of that reality. It's in your best interest yeah. to go with this choice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's in your best interest. Um, you know, for the reasons we talked about, it's gonna it's gonna save you <laughs> yeah, back like, on photos yeah. or or making it a part of our culture. And I think that you know even what you do in this amazing community that's gathered surrounding uplifting content is is a part of this answer in my opinion is that we are making positivity relevant we're mm. making ethical relevant mm. so that so that in you know you start to see this now but you know in one two five ten years time there will be that question of like oh well is what you're wearing ethical and then it's and then it's a it's what you how you present yourself in the clothing that you wear and right. what that clothing the story that it tells about you and what you believe that that is a part of the selfish sort of narrative and psychology of how we purchase and and we make that a part of that and not in a bad way but imagine if that was a part of our our sort of selfish purchasing decisions is that we were like man yeah. but is this going to make me look want, ethical yeah, like, that's yeah. a great question yeah to have. yeah i mean i would rather it be that than like a designer label where yeah. because it when people are doing it if because I, I believe in sort of I would love to see or in my lifetime we shift the attention from people admiring people for the sake of having things and really put more attention on people who are doing things and giving back and those are the people we look up to in society and in the same way previously it's been like do what is how does how do how does what I'm wearing impact my status or how other yeah. people think of me right. by having a designer label a t-shirt that costs you know, two hundred dollars because it has some type of logo, and rather people go, "Oh yes, I want people to know that I make the choices, mm -hmm. or I buy clothes that are impacting people." Yeah. Um, and also, like with uplifting content, one of the things we have is uplifting causes. Yeah. And I know so many people want to help and give back and do something, yeah. but they don't always know how. Right. Like it's not always easy to just yeah. figure it out. And so, just something as simple as buying these clothes 
knowing that it the money a good amount of the fair amount of the money has yeah. gone to people who are making it um that's giving back mm -hmm. you just yeah yeah um from i'm always inspired because you you know you guys have created this beautiful company yeah. and i'm always inspired by people that can make something out of nothing like what challenges have you faced like how has it been like just to kind of give some wisdom to other people that yeah. might want to sort of start something themselves yeah um as you know i mean and anyone who's who's tried to start their own endeavor the challenges are endless and, and <laughs> ongoing. i think that i think that <laughs> any one yeah. of us who who starts something starts with this desire of saying okay it's going to be hard at first but then eventually i'll get to this level where i can maybe hit the cruise control button and you know we'll be we'll have it figured out uh but the thing you realize is that just new opportunities and new levels of, of success just bring new challenges mm -hmm. so it's, that's one thing is that you're never going to get to the end of the road of of you know what is challenging the challenges will just change yeah um another thing is that you know it's it's incredibly hard to start something and to get it to a place where you can pay yourself yeah you know, where oh, yeah I know there's, that there's this idea that you start and then you become successful you know there's the steps you start it and then you start making a ton of money and then you're seen as really successful. <laughs> like that's what the that's the like entrepreneurial story that we tell ourselves. Um, the reality is that you know we worked second jobs and did so many mm. different things for a long period of time as we were were you know getting this organization up and off the ground. Um, and then the last thing that I would say as far as challenges go is. You will always, especially if you're doing something that is that you deem as, as positive or social impact or, or making a significant change in the world, um, there will always be this, this challenge of, of how you do that at the highest level um, and how you, uh, and where your customer's at, where, where they're at and what they're willing to hear and how they are uh, willing to jump in on that with you. And I guess I say that because uh, we started with this notion, this idea that um, everybody's going to care about this. Everybody's going to care exactly about where their products come from because how couldn't you? Mm -hmm. um, and realizing that this conversation, even the one we're having today, is very nuanced than the conversation that was taking place 10 years ago when yeah. we started. Yeah. And realizing that if you're at the tip of the spear, as they say, if you're sort of at the front of, of trying to create some sort of positive impact or social change, that you have to realize that not everybody's at that same level with you. Right. And you have to, part of your job is to help, is to sort of play the long game and help people understand and over time figure out ways to continue to deepen their understanding, their knowledge around what you're doing and why they should be passionate about it as well. Mm. It can be really frustrating because when you know, when you know issues so well, you say, you know, this matters and how could no one else yeah, understand how yeah. much this matters? Look at the, the challenges we're facing, um, uh, especially when you're talking in a commercial sense or from a consumer yeah. standpoint, like you have to uh, take that all in and it, you really have to play the long game. You have to help educate people and, and understand where that person, that supporter, that customer, that audience is at and how you are, you know, engaging them and sort of taking them on a journey over time. That's a really great point that I hadn't always thought about. And I think a good way of doing that is, is through storytelling. Yeah. And just like, just yeah, showing the real people behind it, which is mm -hmm. what you've done. Cause yeah, then they can buy into the idea of the people. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And they can see themselves in it too. Mm -hmm. You know, like specifically in, in our case with fashion, um, with known supply, we, after 10 years of, of doing the headwear and, and operating in, in the fashion space, we sort of looked at it and said, there's a lot of great things happening, positive things happening within fashion. There's new brands starting every day. There's big brands that are taking um, stances on environmentalism and sustainable materials. But we looked at it and we said, nobody is, is really diving into the human side of it, is mm. into, um, the people who are being impacted in this process. And it's my belief 
that 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 is sort of the missing component. Even when you talk about environmentalism or climate change or these really, really big issues is, you know, we hear statistics all day about, you know, the dangers of the polar ice caps melting and we see the impacts of these crazy weather patterns and mm-hmm, extremities mm-hmm. that are taking place. And, and those all, if I'm being honest, to me have felt like have felt distant, have felt separate. And when you talk about our clothing and sustainable materials, it's, it's taking one step there. But for me, the most impactful thing is, is always to ask, but what's the, what's the impact on the people who, who are involved? And, um, and what's the relatability to us as, as consumers to people as opposed to the environment, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's so, a more tangible, like, idea to get around because it's yeah. like you, you can see the direct impact, whereas all these ideas of these things that might happen, yeah. can, we think it's easy to pass off as, well, it hasn't happened yet, it might not happen. Yeah. But when you know that I'm directly impacting somebody by this choice. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think it takes us all, like, we also, you know, we sort of see our specific role to play mm. um, in, in highlighting and, uh, yeah, just shining, shining the light on the actual humans who are part of that process. And there's lots of great groups that are doing um, more advocacy-based work and um, storytelling in different capacities. But, you know, we really wanted to carve out our niche and say, it's it really for us personally, and we feel like this will matter for other people is that it comes down to the humans that are being impacted in the process. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to just quickly skip back. So, yeah. so you said about um, how long did it take because you had all these other jobs while you guys were getting this off the ground. Yeah. How long did it take before you this became like your full time thing? You could let go of those other things. Yeah, probably um, anywhere between like three to five years mm, like so depending well, there's yeah. like there's different sort of stages along the way we also got started at a really young point I mean we were I think 20 years old when mm. we got started we were still university students mm-hmm. um and so we were at a unique stage in life where uh we time was in one sense sort of on our side because mm-hmm. there weren't the same demands and and just realities of life um but yeah that was that was our experience i think a great lesson from that is and i kind of repeat this quite a lot is you have to do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do yeah and just you know starting something you know everybody it's not always wise to quit your job and yeah. just start a new thing totally. especially you have family and responsibilities it's, it's not like that but just carving out the time to start something on the side and yeah. then growing that until yeah. it becomes the thing and you're, you're a prime example of that. And just because I know that there's so many people that have all of these ambitions and goals yeah. and dreams outside of their current situation and it's like, you know, start doing that work on yeah. the side. Yeah, while well, you've got your job. Um, and then the other question to do that is how do you, uh, do you feel like you've got a good work-life balance with sort of spending time with the family and being uh, here? Yeah. Um, so my sort of caveat to, to this idea of like work-life balance is that, and one thing that I, from my experience that I want to share that I hope, hopefully is helpful for other people who are trying to navigate that is that I really, I personally don't believe there's this, this like perfect line you can walk that is like work-life balance. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I got it. Straight. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's all in equilibrium and, yeah. and, and you know in harmony and these things are beautifully happening. I, I and it's I perfect. I think I struggled with that for so long because it always felt out of whack. You know, mm. I'm like, well this is taking too much of my time or energy or this is and like, you know, and then I, I just came to this realization that um you got to at least at the very least take like a 30,000 foot view at this, at this question. Um, and because in any one moment it can be very taxing to think like, is this, are these things perfectly in balance? The reality for me has always been that, um, different seasons take sort of different right precedence and priority. Um, and it's important, especially it's like now I have two young boys and, you know, there over these past three years um, since we had our first, there's been times where family has sort of taken that priority yeah, and where it's just taken a backseat or, you know, there's been years and moments when work has taken that. So I would say 
you know, 30,000 feet up looking down on it. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I have been able to, over time, find a good sort of rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and more than anything else, good communication with between the two, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So that mm -hmm. as there are seasons or as there are moments where one is taking sort of a precedence that that can be acknowledged. Yeah. And to say, hey, this is going to be a wild work season or you know, my family's really going to need me in, in these months for these reasons. And, and it's more about that sort of uh, setting up the, the, the structure and the, and the fluidity of like how those things can happen well mm -hmm. and, and share the load because it's going to go like this. It's going to mm -hmm. be back and forth. Um, and so, yeah, I would say great right now. Um, and some things around the corner that's going to throw it all out yeah. back and then, We'll get back to closer to equilibrium and then something else will happen. Yeah. So um, you just kind of have to hold those things loosely and not beat yourself up in the process when when you're saying, you know, when you're in a season that's just too heavy or, or um, you know, doesn't feel balanced. There, those, are, those will happen. That's really great advice. And again, something I hadn't looked at it that way. That it that it is not going to be sort of straight all the time and there are going to be things that some, some are more and less than and and just being okay yeah. with that and just communicate. Really? Thanks. That's actually how me. <laughs> because I, I will I'll be sort of, sometimes I work, I get up at seven or whatever and I'm working nonstop to 11 p.m. And then, and then I'm just exhausted, but it's yeah. fine because I'm in the flow. And then sometimes I take a bunch of time off and I'm beating myself up because it's a Wednesday right. and I'm like just, you know, at a pool. And I'm like, it is a Wednesday. And well, you know, it's a balance. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, it's only me that's putting that pressure on. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we're our own worst, you know. Enemies in that respect. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, because, because the self-talk is, you know, if you're doing one thing, you're worried about not doing the other thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so how, like, honestly, I think just giving yourself a little grace with this whole Great advice. business entrepreneurial thing is life. Yeah, life. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw this really great quote um, on Instagram, actually, this designer that I follow. And it, it just said, um, you know, please be patient. Uh, first time human. <laughs> like, we're all just, we're all just first time people. We, there's no, there's no in this real life moment, moment, if you believe in it. Yeah. 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 In this, in this, in this moment. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's like, that's something we all just need to, to read to ourselves. Yeah. And we need to read aloud and we need to say, Hey, um, I haven't done this before. I haven't done this, you know, stage of my business right. or stage of family life and we, we have this expectation we put on ourselves more often than not that it's like we should have this all figured out but right. we've never done it before so, so yeah yeah we have to be figuring it out yeah. and so be okay with that work that's what you're doing totally yeah. so you were talking about being preachy earlier now i'm the one i don't think it's preachy i think it's it's beautiful like you but you, you've said things that have really sort of shifted my perspective and made yeah. me see things so i think i try to avoid like you should do this or you should do this and but i mean yeah you know whatever <laughs> i'll take it seriously preachy. you should do that <laughs> but i mean i think it's fair to say be cool be okay yeah. with yourself mm -hmm. be kind to yourself so yeah definitely need a bit more of that yeah. Cole, this has been lovely. Thanks. You are good at this. Travis wouldn't do it. The other <laughs> co-founder. He's calling him out. I know. I know. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> that. But he's fantastic. So now I, I kind of guess why. <laughs> I understand why. Uh, we've also got a, a giveaway with Crochet Kids. Um, and I'll put the link to that. So that's running at the minute. Yeah, that's their other brand. Um, so sign up for that. And there'll be details on where you can find more information about these guys in the, in the show notes. Um, and also stay tuned for a little uplifting content mm -hmm. and known supply partnership that we are in the discussions about. But yes, yes, we are. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks for joining us, guys. I'll be back next Tuesday interviewing Celeste Headley, who's an amazing author. She has a book called We Need to Talk, and it's all about communication stuff. So that's going to be epic. All right, have a great weekend because it's kind of coming. Bye. Bye. Thanks.